strange conflict between where the body begins these, where it turns into a machine, the relationship between body and machine. I think our, I don't know if our next speaker is going to talk about that, but he's able to and has written about it. And in contrast to all the internet and all the machines and all the things we have and the cell phones in our pockets, which are please going to be turned off, please turn off your cell phones. Um, fact is, we're all here in the kind of oldest of media, talking to each other, pressing the flesh, and having the kind of conversations you can only have in person. So with all the technology, entertainment, and design, with all the television and cell phones and all the stuff, there is really a continuum of how we talk to each other, and we should embrace every step along the way. Chris Dudenham. Gee, uh, do I get uh, get to keep one of these? Is this one of my? <laughs> okay. That's mine. That's yours. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of nice little toys in, in the, uh, that bag, Mr. Tapscott's bag. I'd like to pick that up by accident. Um, yeah, I noticed my, my moniker for this conference is a futurist. I thought that's a kind of interesting moniker for me. I've uh, had many monikers before, uh, but I guess since I do talk about future and, and deep future, um, then uh, I guess that, uh, that label does apply. Um, really what I guess a futurist is, is kind of a huckster in a sense. This is somebody who, who uh, you know, it's easy to make a prediction about something that's going to happen about, well, let's say 10 years to be safe. Um, because then you don't really have to have any responsibility for it, I suppose, I don't know. But um, the reason I'm called a futurist is because I talk about a number of things, uh, amongst which transhumanism, I guess, is really the most, um, <coughs> seems to be what raises the most red flags, and I'm going to address that. Um, futurists are funny. I, I was thinking that uh, a futurist, a good futurist, is called a cosmologist, and uh, publishes uh, with Oxford University books like uh, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. How many people here have read that? Just wanted to, <laughs> good. Okay, well then I can just make up anything about it I want. <coughs> It's an interesting book because it's, it's talking about the big picture. Um, I, guess what I, I guess you could call me more accurately a deep futurist because I'm, what we're, I'm trying to look ahead to is what's going to happen as a consequence of these things that we were, well, me. Uh, <laughs> the things that we saw before, uh, before us on the screen. My hair looks all right from behind. It's good. Um, just experimenting with this Tom Cruise style. I'm not sure if I like it. You know. MIT was pretty good, though. Um, so I'm talking about things way, way in the future and, and result of, of what's going to happen. So I guess I'm taking a big picture and I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through human, I mean, the evolution and, and the rise, the rise the, of life on, on this planet. But with a caveat, of course, that, uh, that people, futurists, do make mistakes. Uh, Marshall McLuhan predicted the end of the automobile by the early, I think, 74. Car was gone. <laughs> And now the automobile, of course, is bigger than ever. SUV sales, yeah, I'm going to start, I'm going to start selling like Tapsco a little bit. SUV sales, you know, like, are now 50% of, of, you know, what cars are sold right now. And SUVs are behemoths, industrial behemoths. Um, so we do, make, we do make mistakes as we go along. Now, what is transhumanism? Um, I've been accused of being a transhumanist, as if I were the, uh, some sort of acolyte or perhaps a, the minister of some new sect. Uh, but it's not that at all. Transhumanism, the way I look at the term, is simply the space between human and post-human. And um, I guess what you call the, you know, the transitional phase between what we are now, or actually what we were, because we are now free uh, of the constraints of evolution. We have now passed beyond the pale, as it were. Uh, we are no longer freely evolving species. And this is because of our brains and what they've done to us, and I'll get into that later. Our brains are really a big problem. <clears throat> for the planet, <laughs> as well as ourselves, but I think we can get over them. Um, actually, I remember a Buddhist one time told me that funny little anecdote about uh, uh, these Buddhists were very much into no mind, you know, like having no mind is the best thing. And uh, they were talking about a, a neurosurgeon, who uh, the nurse who was assisting the neurosurgeon was noticed during the operation she had to pick up a scalpel he dropped, and she looked and she could see through his eyes the operating light from in the back of his head. and. Um, so obviously his head was transparent, there's nothing there. And it turned out they x-rayed his, his, his head and 
This is apocryphal story, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> they x-rayed his head, and there was no brain there at all. And, and, um, uh, and this Buddhist told me this with, uh, with, you know, I think they, with some credulity. And <laughs> Buddhists, as Buddhists often are, I love Buddhists, though, don't say, I'm not saying anything bad about Buddhists. It's the religion, I think, really. Um, <laughs> was in Buddhism. It is kind of, it really, well, for reasons I'll talk about later, if I get to them. Um, anyway, his, his head was transparent. The Buddhist told me that, that he, having no mind was getting, out, getting clearing in the way so that this person operated much better, was a much better surgeon without a brain, which I thought was an interesting idea. I wouldn't want him operating on me. I like the Tourette surgeon in Western Canada. You know about him? Anyway. Um, the, uh, what we're getting back here to, I guess I'm getting a little off track, is this notion of, of, uh, of the brain being what, what subjugates us to a certain extent. But I'll get on to that in a little while after defining transhuman. The era, which is just, is not the transhumanists in the States. I don't know if anybody knows, but in California there's a sect called the Extropians, and they call themselves transhumanists. But uh, in actuality, they're, it's something else entirely. And transhumanism, I'd like to make that term really just like value neutral. I love, I love this idea of value neutral. Isn't that great? Um, I like a value neutral term which just says transhumanism is, the, is a, it's a historical epoch between human and post-human. And by post-human I mean whatever, is gonna, whatever we're going to transform into. And we're going to do it, we might do it as soon, uh, I mean this might happen very quickly. Um, so then I guess we're sort of faced with the idea of mortality and um, my lying in bed uh, at, at nights uh, worrying about my own mortality. I can remember that when I was eight. I was quite, I was sort of charmed. I think I was, I was lucky in the sense that I knew what it meant to be alive and um, what, it meant, uh, what it meant to die. Um, I think I was sort of cursed in a sense too because it was a very profound fear. Actually, I would get up and, and run out of the room <laughs> because when you realize there's nothing at the, at the end of your life, there's, there's, um, what was it, Bertrand Russell uh, had a great quote. He said that, um, 1911, I think, that the uh, relationship between uh, consciousness and the brain, or between the mind and the brain, was much more intimate than we'd hitherto th thought. In other words, that the consciousness is entirely, absolutely dependent, or what we think of ourselves as our minds, is entirely dependent on the brain. Um, which is kind of a scary thought, and, and this is sort of with Roland Penrose's The Emperor's New Mind aside, the idea of quantum consciousness, which I think is what's dividing neuroscience right now. Um, so with that caveat in mind, <laughs> uh, I'd like to look at the transhuman condition as really something where we are going to get to the stage where all those things that we intuitively believe about ourselves, that we have a soul, or that we're immortal, or that immortality exists in some way with religions, and this is why I'm getting back to religions again, all these th things in telepathy are things that are actually not capable. We're not capable of physically now, but we will become capable of these physically. Um, right now, in the nuclear arsenals of the world, we have something which is comparable to the power of Jehovah, really. A nuclear bomb is something that is an incredibly powerful event. We take it for granted. Who was it? Uh, Isaac Asimov said that um, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology will appear like a miracle. Mm. And I'd like to actually add to that, to those who aren't familiar with it, <laughs> because a TV set now is something we're very familiar with, or we don't break into applause when we turn the ignition key in our car. <laughs> Ray, it started. But things like the internet, we're very much in awe of right now. So what is the, uh, the goal of transhumanism? I think the goal of transhumanism is to surpass our current biological limitations. That's really basically what it's all about. Um, and, and that's where we are. We, are, we actually are, all of us in this room, transhuman to a degree. We have vaccines. We've, we've altered our immune systems with uh, decoy vaccines. Some of us have implants uh, of various types, both cosmetic uh, or, or uh, well, that may be a few of us who won't admit it, uh, and, and uh, artificial knee joints, those kinds of things. So we are actually becoming fossilized. It's a very good way of looking at it. It's going to be an incremental process. It's not going to happen overnight. We're not going to become cyborgs overnight. But we will, we will blend with our machines. And the machines aren't going to be, it's not going to be like something out of Star Trek where we have these horrible gray people with wire sticking out of them who are just trying to strangle you. Um, because machines themselves are going to become so small and so lifelike um, that, that really that's the way I think it's going to go. 
Um, this transhuman, whoa, this transhuman moniker has been really been a problem for me in Canada. I also advocate the idea of uh, computer authorship and, and uh, uh, our computers are digital apprentices, really. They're, they're learning us. What our computers are doing are these little digital apprentices which, are gonna, which we're slowly going to teach to do what we do. And um, one, of my, one of the things that I do is, is uh, I, I use the computer to create uh, literature, new kinds of literature. And people have attacked me for that, uh, saying that uh, <coughs> uh, machines will never be able to write, and, and uh, this transhuman thing is really going too far, Chris. It reminds me of uh, the response to Sigmund Freud, uh, you know, psychoanalysis, when uh, after the First World War, the, uh, I think the uh, French, uh, the France, uh, French Medical Association had a conference, 1922, the first medical conference after the war, and they, um, <coughs> uh, one of the uh, members stood up and said, uh, said to the director, well, that there's a new science now. Uh, um, a new, a new discipline, which is coming out of Vienna by this, uh, this fellow who's invented it. It's called uh, psychoanalysis. And the man, the doctor who's practicing it, his name is, is Sigmund Freud. And the director of the conference stood up, it was 1922, and said, psychoanalysis is not a matter for science. It's a matter for the police. <laughs> I thought, well, this is very much the reaction that, that, uh, that, that uh, transhumanism has gotten uh, somewhat from the literary community, at least here in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Toronto. Um, so, where are we? Uh, where, what's happening with evolution? You know, for about four billion years, life has been on the planet. They've, they've knocked it back to four billion. The last 500 million years, 500 million years, this is before any rock was being formed uh, that's lying us under us right now. Toronto is up to the, what is it? Uh, I think the Silurian era, so it's 450 million years old, the rock right under us right now, and placed to seem uh, gravel on top of that, and, and then the, the basement in the green room. Um, but in that span of, of five, uh, 500 million years, uh, the last 500 million years, animals have had eyes. I think eyes were, so four billion years of life, and in the last eighth of that time, eyes were invented, as it were, eyes developed. Um, I would feel very claustrophobic without eyes myself. Uh, eyes are very important, the way we visually manipulate our environment. Okay, then out of that last 500 million years, it took almost the entire time, one five hundredth of that time, or one, one hundredth of that time, is the last five million years, which is the, the time in which we've existed as a species. Now, here's, I think, the most important thing that I'm going to talk about, and that is language. Language was invented by our species, and I think it is still <coughs> probably the most extraordinary, fantastic, unbelievable, futuristic technology and that's with everything that we've still done, all the computers and, and the internet and the web and everything. Language is still the most unbelievable, fantastic technology that we have. It's incredible. It's nuts. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> what I'm doing now, what, 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 this, you know, I'm at the front. An animal coming in here would just see, you know, these funny, these apes, one and one at the front making startling, babbling noises, and other ones occasionally reacting to them. I mean, what is going on here? Language is a cognitive, what I call a cognitive prosthesis. And by that, I mean that it is something that changes the way you think. It is a software that we load, probably what, around age two, well, one if you're a girl, because <laughs> um, they speak earlier. Why is that? Well, actually, I'll, I'll get into theories of how language started, because I think that kind of plays into it, maybe. Um, we load a software, which, which actually, I mean, some people think, cognitive philosophers often, I mean, it's a disputed point. Perhaps language is what makes us conscious. Possibly without language, we would not be conscious the way we are. So, so language is an extraordinary technology. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing. It's, it's almost insane. It's, it's a, a symbiosis, really, of sorts. It's like a living organism because it evolves with us. No one person invented the word this, you know. I copyright the term this. I, I copyright this preposition, you know, to. <laughs> I mean, all those things, all those elements were all designed, in a sense, like the alliance uh, notion here in the net. <coughs> Um, so we, here we have this vast consciousness created by language, and it seems to be that our consciousness, I, I've been uh, studying consciousness for, for a little while and um, <coughs> as an observer, uh, as an outsider, <laughs> maybe that's what it is, um, <laughs> as an amateur, <laughs> no actually, 
We're, we're actually all professionals, I think, aren't we, at, at our own consciousness? So we, we play our own roles perfectly. Have you noticed that? We never make mistakes. Anyway, um, I've been watching my, uh, my sort of uh, consciousness for a while and, and reading a lot of people writing about consciousness um, and realizing that maybe consciousness was a bit of a trick. It's, it's an illusion, perhaps, to a certain extent. In other words, we have this feeling of consciousness as being very discorporate, of being floating, of something that, that inhabits us, like the ghost in the machine, the Arthur Kreisler uh, paradigm, uh, if I can use that term. Um, but in actuality, it's, it's, it's really sort of, in a sense, an illusion, a bootstrapped illusion, um, uh, that depends on the architecture of our brain. Now here we get to, now this is, you've got to hear of Mar Marvin Minsky, and, and then uh, Daniel C. Dennett, and then um, uh, Hans Moravec, particularly. Hans Moravec, very interesting guy. Uh, not the nanotechnology person, that's K. Eric Drexler, Eric K. Drexler, I mean. Uh, Hans Moravec believes that consciousness is transferable. The reason he believes this is that as a ma mathematician and a computer scientist, he thinks that we can emulate any given pattern. Consciousness is a pattern in the brain. Uh, there is not really any reason to believe that consciousness cannot be emulated. <clears throat> if that's the case, consciousness can then be duplicated and could be transferred. Uh, at the point at which we can transfer consciousness, and, and I believe that that might actually be possible, um, then we will have a whole new ballgame. Um, actually, I just got a quote from, um, this is a very interesting quote from Daniel C. Dennett, which explains this whole situation quite nicely. Um, Daniel C. Dennett wrote a book called Consciousness Explained. <laughs> and I thought, what a, I was very dubious about that. Mm. Consciousness Explained. Not possible. But actually, he, he did in a funny way. Anyway, this is, the, this is the core quote from the book. Human consciousness is itself a huge complex of memes, or more exactly, meme effects in brains. You know, the idea of memes, the uh, meme is the gene, a genetic uh, as, as genes are to genes, so memes are to culture. The wheel is a meme. Um, Tom Cruise's long hair is a meme. Um, these are all things that we perpetuate independently uh, of one, any one person, that we as a species perpetuate these memes. So the brain, in a sense, because it's software, culturally embedded software that's loaded into us at a very early age, is like a meme complex that can be best understood as the operation of a von Neumann-esque Virtual machine. You know, there's a great quote from von Neumann about life itself. Um, Her, uh, Herman von Neumann is, uh, um, I mean, John von Neumann, um, really interesting guy. Is it Herman or John? Anyway, he had a great quote about life. He said, uh, living organisms are highly improbable. <laughs> How true. They are improbable. And then another physicist, and, and this, if there's anybody here, and I'm sure with this August crowd, there must be somebody who knows this quote, because I'm looking for the attribution of this quote. Life, and this is a physicist who said this apparently, life is a disease of matter. <laughs> I, love the, I love the irony of that. Life is a disease of matter. I mean, as from a physicist, physicist viewpoint, I mean, what is this self-organizing matter? What, what's going on here? Anyway, um, that can be best understood as the operation of a von Neumann-esque virtual machine, the brain is a virtual machine, implemented in the parallel architecture of the brain that was not designed for any such activities. See, there's a great mind. In other words, what we have with language, we are, we are monkeys. And monkeys who have discovered, stumbled onto this sinister <laughs> technology called language. And this, this technology has created who we are, in a sense, and is now creating all of technology. Technology flows out of language. And we have had subsequent, and what I, this is very important, the cognitive prosthesis. Language is a cognitive prosthesis. We have nothing yet which matches that. And um, what we have is music. We have subsequent cognitive prostheses. Music is language without refutation. Art, which is, uh, which is representation without language, right? And, and then writing, which of course is language without sound. And finally, mathematics. And mathematics, of course, is the final language, the, <laughs> the end language, the language that will, uh, that will transform us. Through the, through the algorithms of artificial intelligence and possibly nanotechnology. So I call that uh, mathematics would be the language of hope. Um, because we as a species are just starting a, a stage that a lot of other thinkers are thinking. You know, when I was in, lying in bed at night, I was thinking about my own mortality, which is really scary. I get up, you know, breathe hard, 
you know, think about something else, anything else. Um, you know Jim Morrison's line, no one gets out of here alive? Uh, it's kind of like that, right? We're trapped. Um, that's very scary. But then I think, oh, well, the universe is going to go on forever. And so, um, and then I think, well, no, that's going to end too. I realize, keep that to the universe. So, um, K. Eric Drexler has a very good antidote to that because he says that at the very end of the universe, this is deep cosmology after the, we pass the Omega point where every particle in the universe becomes conscious. Uh, he said that uh, what we can do as the universe collapses in heat death, as it gets colder and colder and colder, um, we'll be able to do more and more co computations because at that point will be just pure information, pure uh, free-floating energy forms who are simply calculations in space, running on run virtual uh, computers that are embedded in matter, quantum matter. Um, and he said that, well, as the, as the universe ends, we'll be able to squeeze more and more time as it cools down because the heat, the thermodynamics of, co of cognitive states like that are such that you have to account for heat. So as, as it cools down, we'll get faster and faster and faster. So he thinks that uh, at the end of the universe, we'll be able to squeeze eternity uh, out of ever faster uh, computational uh, devices. Um, so I guess in closing, I'd like to read you a little piece of, uh, uh, of computer poetry that, uh, this is something else I dabble in. Um, and what this is is a program that took my own writing and recombined it in a way that, uh, let's say, actually a computer program was, uh, was Corinthal, it was the early 90s, uh, what was it called? Babel or something like TurboText or something like that. And uh, what it does is it analyzes your basic style, like the Kurzweil poetry systems, analyzes your style, and then um, writes poems that you could have possibly written. Here's one of them. How many times in the quietness of an ice age darkness have you told me that winter is the light in the kitchen? The icicle that cut me. Birds were visible across the months of sunlight, holding their neutral temperature as if they were the solutions of sadomasochistic algorithms that had flourished long ago on the moon. Her face is a woodlot, containing empty floating islands sculpted by the city she had left forever. She sang with her back to the open door, the door that had blown open four times in the synthetic darkness. Later on in the kitchen, she erased their personal memories. With that, I'll thank you.